Hello, everybody. Um, as you can tell from that introduction, I lead a double life. Um, in one life, I am a lecturer and researcher and so on in Trinity College. Um, I run a research group called the SIG Media Group, and we work in the area of video and signal processing. In the other life, I work with a bunch of people and companies in the post-production industry. And in that life, I essentially make numerical techniques to solve or fix bad pictures, really. Um, so this talk is built around a story from that other life. And the story is about the mathematics of bullet time. And through this talk, you learn a little bit about art history and uh, sneakily learn a little bit about mathematics as well. So I'm going to kick off, like all good talks, about 130 years ago, in 1872. Um, a guy called uh, Leland Stanford made a bet. He wanted to know whether there was, at some point in a horse's gallop, that all the four legs were off the ground. And many of you probably know this story. Anyway, he enlisted the uh, services of a, a man called Edward Moybridge. Now, Edward Moybridge was a bit of a character. So Moybridge um, spent from 1872 to about 1878 trying to solve this problem. So it took him about six years. And in 1878, he published um, this series of pictures, which you may have seen before. Um, and you could see here, he showed two pictures where the horse's feet were indeed off the ground. Well, he went on to publish a famous book called Animal Locomotion. Everybody in the animation industry knows about it today. Um, and um, he, you know, invented this device for controlling the shutters and so on. It's pretty complicated. It's got wires and stuff. And um, the thing that you, you don't know about is, the, is that Moybridge um, used a lot of engineers, right? Nobody knows about the engineers. They just know about Moybridge, which is kind of sad. Um, Anyway, it's clearly, he clearly used some people from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, as it turns out, to make this kit. And what is less known about him, actually, is that um, he took pictures from different points of view. So this is um, some, some plates, and you can see here some stuff. These are different sequences, but these, these are six different camera views of the same action. We'll now skip forward a little bit, about 100 years later, to about 1980, and a man called Tim McMillan. Now, Tim... Um, was just finishing up his degree in arts in the University of Bath, and he knew about Moybridge's funny-looking pictures. And um, he also knew about these funny-looking pictures from a guy called Nadar, who was um, a contemporary of people like Jules Verne and, uh, and so on. And um, this is an interesting set of pictures, right? You see a bunch of views of uh, an object from different points of view, and that's about 1860. So Tim said to me, OK, look, cubism, um, is about expressing different points of view in one picture. So if you think about it, Moy Bridge and all of film is about expressing different points in time from one point in space. So if you want to make like Cubist film, then you've got to do different points in space at one point in time. So um, Tim made this kit, which aired um, in Tomorrow's World um, BBC program in 1993. And uh, this is a, a rig containing a whole bunch of cameras these cameras are pretty small, and they all point towards the center of the rig here. At any one point in time, you could record pictures all the way around the action in the middle of the rig. So Tim was then able to make pictures like this. So you get the idea, right? He took these pictures, which one point in time, different points in space, and played it back as a, as a sequence. So it's pretty flicker, flickery and shaky, but you get the idea, right? And I remember seeing this thing. Um, in, in, in 1994 or something like that. And um, I remember hearing that the next day the BBC were inundated by calls um, asking why did they have to kill the dog? <laughs> because the only way you could do this is to kill the dog, you know, stuff it, stick it through the... Uh, but anyway, now, now you know. Now you know you don't have to do that. So Tim called this in the time slice effect and um, he, um, he then went on to found a, a company called Time Slice Films. Um, so then, a few years later, the Wachowski brothers, seeing this, these sort of developments in Europe, realized, okay, let's rack up the number of cameras to make the effect smoother, and then use more exotic path shapes and put the whole thing in context. And so, in 1999, this thing hit the cinemas. So you know that effect, right? That's called the bullet time effect. And... Um, so 
this is the setup. Okay, you have a bunch of um, actors doing their thing, and you have a bunch of cameras looking at the stuff that's going on, and you have these different points of view. Um, so this is my little toy bullet time uh, sequence. Um, we're going to stick with the horse team inspired by Moira Bridge so long ago. Um, okay, and so it's just a, this is just about 11 frames um, from 11, 11 different cameras. So the problem is to rack this simple process up into a matrix-like bullet time effect. Um, you need more cameras, and you need more cameras than you have space to put cameras. So um, the cameras, they tend to be big, and you can't stick them close enough together to get enough to make the effect look good. So you could think about the problem like this, right? If you think about pictures as um, just little one-dimensional little sticks, and this is an object in one camera, and this is an object in another camera, um, the, the trick is to somehow work out what these in-between cameras would see if you only have these views. Um, so that's a, a little tricky problem. And at this point, people always want to know, did I ever meet Keanu Reeves? Right? <laughs> so, so I didn't. Right? And I have separated from the matrix like everybody else by about six degrees of separation. Um, so the Wachowski brothers, they, um, they produced and directed the thing. They used a company called ESC in Los Angeles to do a lot of the post-production. Um, those guys, they got in touch with um, Bill Collis and Martin Weston and Stella Wilcox, part of the research team of um, a bunch of... Um, uh, research team of a small company in the UK that are, that are very well known for their work in standards converters. And Bill and Martin started thinking about this problem. Bill moved to the foundry and started working with Simon. And Bill knew about my work in a very strange area of automated film restoration. So at the time, um, I was working on trying to make old pictures look like new. So this is some old movies, and we're trying to automatically clean them up. So I got involved, and they asked me, see if I would think about this problem. And uh, my contribution to this problem is just to say, OK, let's assume in the engineering way that somebody told us what the motion was. Right? So let's suppose somebody told us this stuff that we don't know uh, went over here, and this stuff that we don't know came from here. So in that case, we could go, well, this should probably look like this. So I could put, cut this bit and put it here, cut this bit, put it here, and so on. So that's great, except that you, you don't have that and you don't have the pictures either, so you need the motion to get the pictures, and you need the pictures to get the motion. You know, standard engineering, chicken and, chicken and egg problem. Um, what do you do? So it turns out that uh, some observations could be made to help make this problem solvable, right? So the first one is that things, when things move, they don't change color very much, right? So when I move from here to here in this scene, I don't change color very much. Um, when and another thing is that when, because of the, the arrangement of the cameras, the motion is quite smooth. So the, the motion from one frame to the other is not much different from that frame to the next frame. So it turns out that um, it, it's great, those little stick diagrams, but 2D pictures tend to be a bit trickier. And um, you end up having to draw pictures like this, right? So, so this is um, one view, this is the other view, and um, it turns out that one way you could do this is say, well, look, um, what I'm looking for is a bit of motion from here into here that is the same as the motion from here into here, that little yellow line. And we want to find that little yellow line that somehow makes this little patch look like that little patch. Okay? So in, in, in two dimensions, there are a lot more ways to get this wrong. Right? So you end up having to look at sort of uncertainty distributions or probability distributions. So I know it's very late in the night, I'm going to do it to you anyway. <laughs> um, so um, this is a probability distribution of some motion vectors, right? And the, the bottom line is that um, you know, stuff happens here which lets me measure the probability of each one of these motion vectors. So this map is telling me where things are red, things are more likely, and where things are blue, things are less likely. So this vector this way is more likely than that vector that way because this is blue and that is red. So this map is telling me, well, uh, actually, this is probably the best vector, so I could pick it and see what happens. So we could try this for that, um, for that sequence, and this is what it looks like. So 
So I'm taking 11 frames and making frames in between the 11 frames to make 20, so 11 fake frames. And it, it looks okay, except every so often you see some little wobbly bits, right? And the problem, those little wobbly bits are real pain, right? You can't get people in cinema going to watch stuff like that. Um, so it turns out that to solve that problem, you have to start engaging the rest of those observations I talked about. And it is that we know more, right? So motion is smooth from frame to frame. So if I told you that the, these patches around here all move this way, and I asked you, well, what is the best guess for the motion in that middle patch? You would know that, you know, things tend to move roughly the same in, in place to place. So this, the best vector is that way as well. So I'll do it to you again. Right? So now we have a, a, another probability distribution. This time, what it does is tell, it, it tells us what we think the motion it, it should be like. Right? So it, tell, it tells us that these vectors are more likely to be this way than that way. So this is something that is independent of the pictures that we see. So now we have another problem, which is how we combine these two bits of information which seem to be sort of unrelated. And once more, we resort to 200-year-old mathematics and a guy called Reverend Thomas Bayes. The idea is quite simple. What he was trying to say is to reduce your uncertainty, you should combine your information about the things that you see with the information with the things about the things that you feel, which is a bit weird way to say it, but that's sort of what happens. So um, this is the stuff that we measure from the, pixel, from the picture, saying that any one of these vectors is right. This is the stuff that we believe motion should look like. And we put those two things together, and we get something like this. And now it's a lot better, because now we don't have a whole bunch of vectors to pick from that could be right. There's just one or two. So at this point, you will start to say, well, look, there's a big gap between these funny-looking pictures and something that actually works, right? And, <laughs> and you'd be right. So in this talk, I'm going to simulate that exercise by some mathematical sleight of hand and I'll show you some mathematics and then say Shazam! Right? <laughs> and we're going to look at some pictures, right? So this is what happens when you put all these things together. So no more wobbly bits. Generally looks pretty good. Okay, so on the left here, what I'm doing is taking uh, 11 frames and going to 22 by just repeating them. And on the right, I'm taking 11 frames and going to 22 by building these new frames in between according to these uh, this motion information. So you can see on the right is like way smoother than on the left, right? So then it turns out that there's nothing really stopping me from trying to make frames in between any old frames that you give me. So why not make frames between ones in time? So this is 25 frames per second sequence. And I'm going to slow it down by a factor of four by building four new frames in between the frames that you have, right? So this is four times slow down. Fake four times slow down. So I didn't use a special camera. It's the same camera and built these things in between. So here is another sequence on the left. So we go from 25 to 100 on the left by repeating frames and on the right by doing this um, funky interpolation stuff. And uh, what's neat here is that um, the, you know, these, these earrings look pretty good. This is full speed, this is fake slow motion. Okay, so this is from a, a Bacardi commercial from a few years ago. Um, so the left again, repeat, and you see this sort of jerkiness, and the right, it's all quite smooth. So you're probably fed up seeing these pictures now. Um, so we're gonna do something new. Uh, so I've been experimenting with um, consumer 3D um, stereo cameras, right? So you know those cameras, they have two cameras in the one. You, know, if you take one picture for the left eye, one picture for the right eye, and you see, you see 3D. These are two pictures from a, from a camera like that. It turns out that you could use this process to make more views in between, even though you only have two pictures. So, so these are a bunch of pictures in between the left and the right. And I could show you what this looks like. So. That's my left view, that's my right view, and now I'll just make a whole bunch of views in between. So you're kind of funky, right? You have 3D without 3D glasses. <laughs> and just to go completely crazy, here's another one, right? So here's left view, right view, and um, 
I had um, Francois from the lab pull a mat for this guy. So we worked out what is foreground, what is background. And I'm just going to, in between the two frames, to give eight views, and then pull those things out and stick them on the left view. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not great. I mean, the matting isn't really professional, but you get the idea. <laughs> I've more or less come to the end here. So next time you, you, you sit down and look at the matrix, yeah, as you do on a Saturday. Um, <laughs> Remember about time slice and bullet time. Remember the place of Macmillan in that long line from Moybridge to Wachowski. Um, and I got to thank all these people who gave me pictures from uh, Tim and Green Parrot, Francois, Simon, and so on. And um, always when you look at these things, don't forget the engineers. <laughs>